morning. Are you coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. Today is going to be a good one. Uh, we'll be finding out how Britain's Got Talent legend Paul Potts, who's here, he went from phone salesman to global success. All the while, I'll be cooking him wild boar sausages with gnocchi and a Korean fish burger. Not together, two separate dishes. Uh, Mexican chef Santiago Lastro will be here in the top 100 best chefs in the world at the moment. Uh, he's serving up some authentic food from his homeland when he makes his Saturday morning debut. Don't miss this week's Little Masterclass where I'll be giving you a step-by-step -step guide to making the perfect summer pudding, just as we're in summertime now. But my first guest in the kitchen is one of the finest, in fact, the finest Spanish chef working in the country today, and a man I'm lucky enough to call a good friend. It's the brilliant Mr Jose Pizarro! <laughs> Welcome to the house, Chief. Welcome to the house. You are always welcome anywhere. Congratulations. You're expanding the restaurant empire. You're going global. I'm going to Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi? Oh, we are in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, and tell, tell us that the site is in a hotel. It's, it's exciting. It's absolutely... Beautiful part of the world. It's incredible. The hotel is um, it's just looking from the window. It's just, it's just... Out into the ocean. The ocean. <laughs> it's just absolutely incredible. The food, the people. And uh, yeah, so looking forward to, it's wonderful. to going back. It's wonderful. Well, what are you going to be cooking for us a little bit later anyway? Uh, it's going to be one dish that I'm doing there in Abu Dhabi. It's a very creamy rice yeah. with a really special prompts, uh, peas and uh, carabineros. Okay. Carabineros are very big prom. Okay. I'm looking that you are going to just love it. Can't wait for that one. But talking about seafood, I'm, I'm going to cook you a seafood, not from, not from your native homeland, we're going to use clams, and these are just from down the road. Look you I know you've been looking at these, thinking these were from abroad. These are amazing. Look at these, they're amazing. And I'm going to do a simple little clam dish, and I thought, as soon as you're here, I'll do it from... all from this area, uh, down near the south coast, and I'm going to do these clams, I'm going to do these uh, chorizo. This is a berico chorizo, not from Spain but from down the road, using that amazing Iberico ham. But I thought we'd do it with orzo. So orzo is a, a type of pasta. So this is your orzo. It looks like rice, really. What you want to do is season it really well, the water, so plenty of salt. Remember, Cal the late, great Carluccio. Every time I, I cook rice um, and pasta like this, I always put plenty of salt in, because I then look up, <laughs> make sure I put enough salt in, make sure he's checking. Always one more. <laughs> always a little bit more. We well, should taste of the sea. And then I'm going to put this orzo in here. That, well, there we go. And we're going to bring this to the boil and just, just cook that. All the while, I'm going to make a nice little dish using these amazing clams. So the first thing I'm going to do is cook, simply just cook the clams. A uh, little bit of fennel, a little bit of shallots, a little bit of garlic, uh, and a touch of wine, because we're going to make a sauce from this as well. So we're going to take all this and just chop it all up and then start frying this all off together. Now, like I said, it's down the road. And when we first started this, about three years ago now, we, we started introducing you at home to all the amazing suppliers. We're going to introduce you to a couple of suppliers on the show today. But all the amazing suppliers we have in this country and, and, and to give you the opportunity to be able to not just visit them, but also taste the stuff as well. So today's no exception as well. We're ready. We're going to go down to uh, Swanage uh, to meet up with Tom Greasley from Purbeck Shellfish. I can see him there in the beautiful sunshine uh, down there, dressed for the part as well. So, welcome to the show, Tom. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, and it's a pleasure to speak to you as well, because it's a fascinating story, this, how you first started. So, where did, you, where did your love affair with fishing come from? Where, where did it first start? Well, I've always done angling as a sort of a passion of mine, still is now. Um, and when I left school, I bought my first boat at 16 and worked on that uh, as crew until I was 18. Um, and that was recreationally taking anglers out, fishing, holiday makers and, and seasoned anglers out. Um, and it sort of grew from there, really. Um, went on to commercial fishing and now we run um, three uh, um, angling boats uh, and a commercial boat as well. Now, you've jumped forward because, because buying your first boat at 16, 16 years old, you buy your first boat thinking this is what I was going to do, but you weren't even allowed to skipper it till you were 18. No, that's right, yeah. So I had a crew with me for... For a couple of, or skipper for a couple of years um, until I was old enough to, to skipper it. And then t tell us about the area where you are now, because uh, I mean, Pool Harbour, particularly, is one of the second biggest natural harbours in the world, out, apart from Sydney. I mean, it's an amazing yep. place to, to visit anyway, let alone, I mean, you've got, your job is amazing because look at, look at behind you. What are we looking at behind you? What, what's behind us? Uh, so, so that's Swanage Bay, um, Old Harry in the distance, Ballard Down and the far 
distance there is Bournemouth. So yeah, the Purbix, it's yeah, the Isle of Purbix, a lovely place. And what makes the area so special, particularly for, for, for seafood and clams, but particularly for clams? What, why that area? So, Pool Harbour's um, filled with mud, mud flats, um, loads of nutrients in there. So, the, the shallow ground is ideal for the, for the clams. But, the, um, yeah, the area is a MSC um, fishery. So, it's, you know, part of the Marine Steward Council. It's um, a sustainable fishery in Pool Harbour there. It's been going for years. There's only 40 licenses issued. It's very strict on sizes and, um, you know, who fishes it. And, yeah, it seems there doesn't seem to be a shortage of stocks, that's for sure. It's, you know, it's it, a lot of small on the ground. Because you would um, think, you, I mean, yeah, you've got Jose in here, and I know that clams, I mean, they're an essential part of the, your menu, aren't they? Totally. Always we need to did, have clams. Did in you there. know they were produced just down the road from where we are now? I think I need to go to visit you, but very, very soon, my friend. <laughs> that <laughs> look absolutely amazing. <laughs> and this clam, look at that. It's just they're, so beautiful, they're, so clean. That you just and tell us, I mean, you, you mentioned oh, Jose I mentioned did. been clean. You're one of you're one of the few sort of uh, clam fishermen that. That, that collect these, but also you clean them as well. Explain the process, because you can't just take them out of the sea and then serve them. What, what's the process? How, what do you go through before you even begin to even sell them? What's the process that you go through? Yeah, so this started... Um, the idea of this started... Actually, I was sat in bed with COVID, <laughs> wondering what to do, and then... Um, <laughs> sort of, as many of we us sort were, of to be honest with you. Like... Many of us were. Yeah. Um, so I sat there thinking, you know, what can we do to try and improve, um, you know, work smarter, not harder, so to speak. So cutting out the middleman. Um, so at the moment, if they're caught, they're sold straight to wholesale um, and they do this process. We do our own thing. So they go through um, UV light or the water goes through UV light in special tanks. That takes all the bacteria out. Um, they have to be in there for a minimum of 42 hours. And then after that, um, they can come on out and they're, they're clean and ready to be eaten. Amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, really? Absolutely amazing. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to recap what I'm going to be doing with these as well. So I've got my ozo pasta here, I've got the clams, I've put them next to the chefy over here so you can have a taste of them. I'm going to use some really good quality olive oil in here and start Oops. frying off some of this. Now, this, this is interesting stuff. This is, as a, as a Spaniard, you'll appreciate this. This is our Berico pork. Yeah. Now, the reason why I wanted to put this with what you've got, Tom, over here, is I don't know whether you know this, farmer, but up on the hills, there's a Mangalista pig producer. Yeah. Up near you. And I'm going to put the two together, the clam and the Mangalista, the, the, the chorizo, and put all this lot together with some chilli and bits and pieces and make a nice little sauce out of this to go with the orzo pasta. So in we go with the... the uh, the shallots, in we go with the garlic, in we go with the chilli. I'm just going to make a nice little sauce out of this, turn this down a little bit now. And this goes in there. Now, this is appropriate with you, really, when I put this, this uh, chorizo in, because... Is this right? You don't eat fish at all? No shellfish, no fish? No. No. That, that looks nice. Don't ruin it by putting the clams in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're a clam fisherman, a fisherman through and through, and... and don't eat fish at all. Any uh, any fish. Nothing. No. 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 <laughs> You're quite adamant on no, that. No, even right? not fish and chips. Right. Uh, not even fish yeah. and chips. No, savaloy. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why is that then? Because you, you you do it for a living. You don't want to see it. What? What is that? I just don't like it. I've tried, and I've had people <laughs> cook it for me, saying, "Oh no, we can get you to like it." And no, no, doesn't. I'll tell you what, Tom, no, it's just a, good not job, interesting. a good job I'm here promoting this stuff for you, isn't it, really? Because, you know... Uh... I know, I know. People say to me, oh, how do I cook them? I say, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> well, what you do is you just say, if you do decide to cook them, Tom, a little bit of white wine, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of, a little bit of fennel, that kind of stuff. We're going to take these Time. And, and break them open. So, so with clams, do, do you... I'm assuming where, where you are and where you're fishing, do you then do you rotate where you fish, or is it is it one of those things the tide brings in the, the clams and you can go fishing on the same bed day after day? How how does that all work? Because it's unlike fish, I suppose, where you drift over uh, wrecks and stuff like that. How does it work with clams? Yeah, no, you're right. So it's um, they do the the beds do hold the clams quite well, but we do move areas. But you know the tide will affect them, the pressure affects them, so much stuff. 
the same as all fishing, really. It's not you. You think, oh, they're they're clams. They um they won't go far, but it's surprising how much they move up and down in the mud, and how hard they are to to catch some days. And, they and certainly outsmart me sometimes. Certainly outsmart you. And you're catching you're catching how many a day? Because I mean, these are beautiful, by the way. Yes, Look at them. Absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I've never seen stuff like this, particularly in the UK. They, where, how many are you catching on a basis? I presume there's two seasons for you. One of which is ca caught by hand. And that's a lot less caught than it yeah. is by dredging. Yeah, a lot less. Yeah, a lot less. So um, it depends really on on the fishing. Um, but like, if I can do 100 kilos in a day, 150 kilos in a day, I'll be happy. But I can't physically process that amount. So I sail stuff wholesale and then some through my machine. So we're just going to finish it off with a little bit of lemon. I've got some lemon in the breadcrumbs like that. And then just a touch of lemon juice, I've got a bit of chilli in there, we've got a little bit of butter, we're going to mix this all together. And then salt and pepper. See, Tom's checking it all out, he's keeping an eye on it, what I'm doing. A nice amount of salt. Cool. And then we can mix all this lot together. I Maybe they are. Look amazing. That doesn't look too bad, does it? Oh, uh, the simplicity, the flavour, the smell coming through, the smokiness from the chorizo is yeah. absolutely... I'm glad you say it better than me. Yeah. Chorizo. Pork and clam. Can you say? Can you teach our sound man to say chorizo? Because he still calls it ch chorizo. Chorizo. Yeah. Matt. Chorizo. Yeah. Thank you very much. There you go. There you go. And then we've got some breadcrumbs, which you can fry off. He's still looking at this thing. He's, I'm not selling it to. I'm not selling it to Tom at all. <laughs> no. We've just got a nice little bit of that. And because Jose is here, a little drizzle of the old, good quality Spanish extra virgin olive oil. And there we have it. My version of Ozo with clams from just down the road and also Iberico sausage from just down the road. Done. How's that, Tom? That looks good. It, it looks good, but I don't yet. want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks nice. Anyway. <laughs> good to see you. I'll see you doing them down there next. Cheers. Cheers, bud. Thank you. There we have it, Chief. Yes, my friend. That's right, you're straight, isn't it? That, that, that I think I'm going to have the whole thing. <laughs> you're going to have the wine, <laughs> play all this, yeah. and happy, happy That's day. It's like a street, that, isn't it, really? Mm. <laughs> I love this type of food. And it's interesting, that's not the first fisherman I've ever spoken to who hates fish. Doesn't eat fish, doesn't eat shellfish, doesn't eat it. Good for us. Another more way for us. We, we need them. people like that, but more for us as well. There we go. So, Jose will be cooking for us later on this morning, and we're joined in the kitchen by Santiago Lastra very shortly. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're serving up more mouth-watering vegetable dishes in aid of the Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'll be giving you the essential guide to making the perfect summer pudding in this week's Little Masterclass. And top tenner, a massive foodie, Paul Potts, will be dropping by the house very shortly. Right, it's time for another recipe. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been getting behind the ITV's Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign to get kids eating more veg. And this year's campaign is about to come to an end, but I thought I'd share with you an inspirational recipe that makes the most of my own homegrown produce from just down there. Enjoy this one. Now, you don't have to be an expert gardener, and I'm by no means one of those, to grow really nice beetroot at home. You can buy the little beetroot plants, really. And the great thing about this, it grows all year round. And you can buy them from a garden centre, grow them from little sort of plants, and then pop them in the ground, and you get an amazing selection of beetroot. But whatever you do with the cooking of the beetroot, you must leave the skins on, whether you roast it, whether you boil it, whether you steam it, and peel it afterwards. Otherwise, the skin bleeds, and all the flavour and all the colour comes out of it. But I'm actually just going to simply roast these. Now, I'm doing it on the barbecue. You can simply do this in an oven, really, exactly the same way. A little bit of tin foil, and I like to use this because it, it doesn't ruin a dish or a white dish like that makes it a nightmare to clean. So you just use a little bit of tin foil, a little bit of paper, and just pop the beetroot on it. You don't need to uh, peel them, nothing. Just leave them as they are. A little bit of olive oil, like that. Now, you can put a touch of water in this if you wanted to. And all you do is just season this up. A bit of salt and pepper, like that. 
and then some fresh thyme. A little bit of thyme in there, and all I'm going to do is basically just cover this over. Now, in an oven at home, you're looking at about 200 degrees for about 45 minutes to an hour. This is a decent sized piece, so you give them an hour. Alternatively, on the barbecue, again, a good sort of hour on the barbecue. These will just cook nicely. You just pop them on there and just leave them, really. That's it, simple as that. Leave them to cook. And then I'm going to serve this with a nice little sort of dressing. And this dressing has got hazelnuts with it. It's got a nice little bit of breadcrumbs. But the base of the, the dressing is, again, some beetroot. And I've got some beetroot juice over here as well. So we take the beetroot juice. Keep that away from your nice shirt. But beetroot juice that you often see on health channels. I don't watch health channels, but you can see it on health channels if you want to. But beetroot juice, apparently it's really good for you, especially when you add sugar. But I'm just going to put some sugar in it. And by basically bringing this to the boil and reducing it, what I'm going to do is turn this into a lovely syrup. And that syrup is I'm going to use as a nice little dressing to go with the beetroot. So once your beetroot's cooked, I'll just lift that to one side, but this literally just cooks, like I said, for about an hour. What you want to do is peel it, and what you end up with is this amazing beetroot over here, like that. Now, you can see the difference with heritage-style beetroots, which I've got growing over there. You get a variety of different colours and shapes. Um, but it's lovely, fresh beetroot like that. Next, to add a little bit of texture to this salad, I'm going to add some hazelnuts and some breadcrumbs, or rather just some sourdough. And we're just going to make a, a nice little bit of dressing that, if you think of this, I'm going to fry it off, but I'm also... This is the vinegar side of it. So I'm going to add a touch of vinegar to this, and then I'm going to amalgamate the two together. So it's like a split dressing. So we've got plenty of oil in here, and that way we can just pop in the bread, straight in there, and then I can pop in the hazelnuts. Now, the hazelnuts, we can just crush nicely. Plate. That'll do. So I'll just give it a whack. That'll do. And then you just pop the hazelnuts and the bread in the pan. And we're just going to basically just lightly brown these. These will take a couple of minutes. So the advantage you put in the hazelnuts, you can do this with almonds as well if you want, is you can toast them all off together. You see, you just get a nice light toasting. The most important bit is, is don't over toast it, otherwise it just goes bitter. So as soon as you're happy with that, take it off the heat. Now, to stop the cooking, this is where we can make it into a dressing by just using some white wine vinegar. But white wine vinegar and sherry vinegar work really, really well with beetroot. But you just want a little bit of vinegar. It's going to stop the cooking, fundamentally, like that. But you get this beautiful colour from it. Now, you can also see in here, this has been reducing it down. It sort of goes into this light syrup. It's fantastic, that. And we just keep that reducing down. So you've got this beautiful dressing. We've got our syrup. Now we can turn our attention to our cheese. Our cheese, really, really simple. For this, in fact, I'll pop the dressing straight in the bowl, really, so you can see it better. There you go. That's going to go straight in there with the crumb, with everything else. And we can leave that to one side. Now, our cheese mixture, I use a combination of two, really. We've got mascarpone cheese, or you can use creme fraiche, or a thick creme fraiche, or cream cheese, you want, really. And then I like to use a really light goat's cheese. I'm not a big fan of goat's cheese, I've got to be say, said, but mainly because... Well, anyway, that's another thing. It's just a... Just a no, anyway, I shan't go there. But not nothing dodgy, but I just don't like the shape of a goat's... Anyway. But goat's cheese itself, I use a lighter goat's cheese. And you can often get goat's cheese now, which is a combination of goat's cheese and cow's milk, uh, which is a good one to go for. It's much lighter in flavour. I think, find a lot of goat's cheese is quite chalky sort of, when you taste it. So a little bit of black pepper. Mix this together. And what you end up with is a nice lighter variant of goat's cheese, which kind of pleases everybody, including me. Mix that together. Now, I'm going to be a bit chefy with this, really. I'm going to take a piping bag, pop it in there. All the while, you can see in this pan what's happening with that beetroot juice and this sugar. What you end up with is a nice syrup. Now, you can do it without the sugar, but I like putting a little bit of sugar with this because when you taste it all together, you get this pickly sort of taste. And a pickle is sugar, vinegar, and liquor. 
i.e. a little bit of water or a little bit of beetroot juice, that. But it's that combination of sugar and vinegar. So we've got a nice little bit of cream cheese in a piping bag. We'll lose that to one side. You can see in here now, this is starting to bubble and reduce down. Take it a little bit further as well, like that. And then we can simply serve our beetroot, really. And the important thing with this is this is a tip from my mother. We used to use tons of beetroot on the farm when I was growing up. It was to always oil your hands. It's a little bit of oil, like that. Because the oil will stop the beetroot from making your hands go pink and red. Apparently. About to find out. But you take your nice little beetroot like that. And you can slice this through. And you can see homegrown beetroot, oh, just looks tastes amazing. I mean, just look at that. Look at the colours from it. But you slice the beetroot like that. It's not really working, Mother. It's not working at all. Look, a few bits of... And we don't waste any of the beetroot as well, so keep, keep the, the root bits. We just pop it all over, like that. And then one more. Although I just keep your eye on your reduction cooking away nicely. That looks pretty good to me. Just check it's worked. No, it's not worked. Just wear gloves next time. This is now ready. Look, you can see that's gone to a lovely syrup. We can just leave that to one side. And because we've got the vinegar in with the crumb and everything, when we mix that together with the vinegar, the sugar and the vinegar is going to get that pickle which you want for your nice little bit of veg. We'll put our combination of our crumbs and our hazelnuts. So a few bits of that on. You got this amazing reduced, look at this, like the syrup. Bit of that over it as well. And because you've got the sugar in here, that combined with that combined with the vinegar and the oil from everything else, this is where you get your pickle from. The colour's that, beautiful. And then not only that, we've got our cream cheese, which we can just take little bits of. The point of this, as you're eating it, you get this whole dressing, everything, all just works together. And you can serve this hot or cold, it's entirely up to you. And then I've got a selection of different herbs. I've got little nasturtium flowers. I've got a little part of my garden there which has got edible flowers in it, really. Nasturtiums with beetroot is a great combination, really. But you've got that, and I've got little beetroot leaves. I've got tiny little beets growing in the garden there. And I've just taken some of these leaves, particularly when they're in this small sort of leaf like that. You can just put a few of these on it as well. And there you have it. It's a simple salad. It takes a little bit of time cooking the beetroot, for sure. But let's face it, if you are growing your own beetroot at home, you don't want to rush things, do you? That, a little bit of olive oil over the top. Looks pretty good to me, that, doesn't it? Just remember to wash your hands afterwards. Mother. I hope you enjoyed that and hopefully it inspired you to get cooking. And if you want more recipe ideas, don't forget to check out the Eat Them to Defeat Them website. Right, still to come, we've got recipes on the way from chefs Jose Pizarro and Santiago Alastra. Um, we'll see you back here in a couple of minutes where we'll be whipping up a gnocchi with wild boar sausage for top tenor Paul Potts. I'll see you after the break.
Welcome back. Now, coming up, chefs Jose Pizarro and Santiago Lastra will be showcasing their amazing skills in the kitchen. But first, I'm here in the kitchen with a singing sensation whose voice is almost as big as his love of food and cooking. It's the brilliant Paul Potts! Yeah! First of all, first of all, it's great to have you at the house as well. Now, now I'm, I'm a bit nervous with this, because now I've got my own vineyard now. I'm giving you wine, because you, you, you're a big lover of food and wine. Yeah, well, I, when I used to work for a major supermarket, a different one to the one you've worked with, yeah. <laughs> um, they, they trained me as a wine advisor, so I right. got to drink wine every week. And because yeah. I didn't drive at the time, I didn't have to spit any of it out. That's quite a nice job, though, isn't it? It's great. <laughs> and, um, but on, on one particular tour in Korea, I was actually on the... Um, I was actually on the on the jury for the Daejeon um, Wine Festival, and right. the, which was being looked after by the Berlin Festival. Right. So I was drinking. I think I drank three hundred different wines. That's a tough job. A isn't day it? for three days. And were you singing at the same time? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to. We're going to. I'm going to cook you a lot. I know you're a big lover of Italian food as well. I'm going to do a classic sort of potato gnocchi. Uh, I'm going to serve that with a lovely little bit of wild boar sausage as well, a little bit of deep fried mm. sage, and some of this amazing sort of radicchio there. We're going to serve with it as well. So, a little bit of this, we're just going to take our gnocchi, potatoes, of course, baked potatoes, put through a potato ricer, some flour, salt and pepper, some parmesan. That's that one, first of all. But I want to go right back before 2007, because I can't believe it's 2007 when you won it. Is it everything you anticipated it was? When you did win it, because I suppose, suppose when you're doing something like that, it was one of the first, the first, really, mm. I suppose, wasn't it, really? And you, you sort of walked onto that stage. What was the feeling like? Well, I'd, I'd pretty much not sung for four years before, because I'd had a, a large tumour. And then when I got back from seven months off sick with that, three days after I started back at work, I got knocked off my bike. Right. and was off for another seven months, so I couldn't afford to continue singing. So when I, when I stepped onto the stage on that first audition of Brent's Got Talent, I wanted to walk keep walking and walk off the other end. But I did end up going on and... Um... And you end up selling five million records, thousands of appearances all, the way, all around the world. Where did it all go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> You've just finished a UK tour as well. Tell, tell us about the UK tour, cos this, this kind of been your... But you came straight out of that and I presume you went straight into arenas and bits and pieces like that. You still love it as much as you always loved it? Yeah, I, I love getting to perform. And I'm, I'm often asked what you know, what the definition of success is. And people always have this idea of what you have is what defines success. It's, what you, it's who you are and what you do. And if you're able to do what drives you, what makes you you, then by definition, you're a success, so... And it, is it everything you thought it would be? Because when you speak to people about music and, 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 you know, fame and stuff like that, yours was so instant. For you, it was just, I mean, straight away, bang. Well, I didn't have any preconceptions, and I think that helped me. I mean, I, I just kind of... And I still do it to, to, to a great extent, just take each day as it comes. So it does freak you out sometimes when you get a booking inquiry for three years' time, and you think, well, what am I going to be doing by then? <laughs> uh, because I, I've never taken anything for granted. It's, you know, I, I, I love what I do, but I know that I get to do what I do because people are buying my CDs and buying tickets to watch me perform. Without, without that, I wouldn't still be doing it. And I suppose in a world where it, you can be surrounded by that, you are you are very grounded. You know, I, we've had we've had singers on before who've come with the entourage and everything else. You you haven't got that. You just turn up. Well, I think if you've got hangers on, then you have less freedom. But also, you know, you've got to pay for it down the line. Well, yeah, that, that as well. <laughs> that as well. But I mean, I've, in in Germany back in 2008, I was offered a minder, and. And, and I said, no, it's going to be somebody but, like, the proverbial. And that, all that's going to do is distract people from... You know, it's going to make me come across badly in many ways as yeah. well. But, but it's going to tell people that they can't approach me. And, and also, I have to be considerate towards him. Yeah. And then suddenly a day where I don't have um, a schedule has to have a schedule, cos I feel like I should actually say, I'm going to do this, that and the other. And, you know, so you end up having not that much freedom. And I was talking to you earlier about, about food. I mean, the travel, the places that you've been to, the places you're about to go to. I mean, you just finished a UK tour. You're about to go the other side of the world. What's that like in terms of having that following as well, to, to continue that? Um, it's, it's great to be able to experience different, um, different cultures and different food. And, 
And, then, and if you can find your way into New Zealand when it's, when it, when it's the, the oyster season, which I, I always seem to be there. I love it when you associate each place with food. I love this. <laughs> I love this. And where's some of the most fantastic, fantastic places you, you can food? I suppose Asia has got to be one, some of the most magical places, isn't it, when it comes to food? Yeah, they, they care a huge amount about their freshness. So I, I, tend to, I tend to lose weight every time I go to Asia because they don't need to add as much rubbish into their food to make it taste of something because they're really obsessed with freshness and the flavours are just, you know, just there. Well, I think very soon, I know you're a lover of Italian food as well. So I've got in here, I mean, this gnocchi, what I've done is just poached it like this. So this comes out, I've got Parmesan, I've got a little bit of egg yolk in here to bind it all together, salt and pepper, that goes in there. I'm going to lose this out of the way because in this pan now, I can then start to sort of not start and finish our, finish our dish really with this one, but we take some olive oil, really good quality olive oil. I'm going to fry off these wild boar sausages. Mm. Now, at the same time as this, I'm going to prepare the rest of it. So we've got our wild boy sausage, that's going to go in there. At the same time, I'll just quickly wash my hands. But I'm going to deep fry some sage and deep fry some capers with this as well. So I think with this, if you're going to do... Well, you can either just use sage if you want as well, but deep fried sage is amazing. Now, if you're going to deep fry capers, just be careful that you get the decent capers, because a lot of the capers you can get is... is water and obviously putting water in a fryer is not not a good idea but you'll see by just chucking a few of these in not now but they start to puff up and what they do is they they open up the flour as well in this at the same time now you can add the sage leaves and you can start to fry all this lot together you get this beautiful crispy sage mm. crispy sage and and crispy uh, capers all in together. And what you want to do is cook the sage till it goes almost translucent. And you can tell when it's translucent when this bubbles, this moisture disappears. And then what you can do is lift this off and tip this out. And you've got your crispy fried sage and your crispy capers in there. Makes a great topping with pasta and bits and pieces. I'm going to use it with gnocchi, but this is fantastic. So tell us about the new album, because this... I mean, it's been announced as your first real classic album, this one. Um, well, what, it... what, make, what makes it different to what people would be familiar with in the last ones, really? How, how does that make it different? Um, well, it started, really... It started, like, when, during, during the first lockdown when I was doing daily performances. I did about 220 daily performances during lockdown. And I thought, well, I'll record some of them. Right. So I went into the studio and thought, well, maybe I'll do 15 or 16 tracks. In the end, I recorded 41. So it ended up being a double album, and it only just squeezed onto two CDs. Well, I said the proof is in the pudding, and we know this anyway. I'm just going to continue to cook these, because let's look at, look at you in action. Just, just check out this gentleman at work. So look, I know you've got your one eye on your food over here. Uh, so we've got an here. This is this. So in I've got the gnocchi and everything else. The, the sausages I've got in here. We're going to make a sauce all basically out of the same pan. So the sausages have just been cooking away nicely. We can take this. This all goes in now. So it's going to be an olive oil based sauce. Yeah, olive oil, but, but I'm going to put obviously butter to thicken it up and, and add a touch of cream. Um, because we're going to take a little bit of parsley. And the parsley and the lemon and everything else will all start to bring it together. So a touch of, touch of cream. Because the Italian, Italian cuisine can be some of the most abused cuisine there well, is. Well, they still use a bit of cream, though, don't they? There's a lot of people say... It's just part, yeah. Yeah, they still use, still use a touch of cream. And I think, you know, the dairy shouldn't be... I mean, people know that I love my dairy anyway, but it shouldn't be taken out. But a little bit of lemon, like that. But what I love about this is just simple, fresh flavours. Touch of lemon juice, like that. Lemon zest. Black pepper. And it's almost there. 
You see, it's not swimming in the cream, it's just holding it all together. Because in a carbonara course, the cream is an absolute no no. Well, uh, yeah, well, I know that, yeah, exactly, yeah. Because yeah. the people that originated the dish couldn't afford cream, so they didn't add any. Yeah, exactly, so, but look, we're going to take our gnocchi, and you've got this lovely little colour on the gnocchi as well when it's pan fried. Probably put another piece on there. It's probably the easiest pasta to make overall as well. I think it's, you know, the thing about it is you start off with a nice little bit of potato like that, nice and simple, and then we're going to finish this off, like I said, with the capers and the deep fried bits of sage. You get the crispiness from it as well. That sits on there. And then the stereotypical chefy drizzle of olive oil, which every chef has got to have. Just a little bit of olive oil over the top. And then we're going to finally, finally, just put a tiny little bit of parmesan over the top of there. And there we have it. Paul Potts, or AKA Pots and Pans, I found out your nickname <laughs> is. That is dish number one for you. My knocky with wild boar. Done. <laughs>
love at the first sight, you know. Exactly. I was well, like, I'm going to be the, well, doing that for I the rest of my life. I can't believe you've just done this while we've been with... Tell yeah. me about this cheese thing, because <laughs> you talked about mozzarella. This, this is kind of made in a similar version. Yeah, yeah, so this is it's, it's called Oaxaca cheese. Yeah. And it's a very, very traditional cheese from the south of Mexico. And it is similar as, as mozzarella, but it's quite stringy. It's like a stringy cheese. But this isn't, so, made in, this isn't made in Mexico, this cheese. No, it's not. The, the recipe and the idea is from Mexico, but it's made in Kent. So it's, it's this farmer but, called Jerry. Uh, that's a big shout out to Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> if he, he, he's probably definitely watching. Yeah, this it's is because, Jerry's cheese from Kent. Yeah. Love yeah, this. Love yeah, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the good old Jerry. Yeah. Uh, so he, uh, we, we work uh, with my brother, Eduardo. We, we worked together with him for a year to be able to nail this recipe. Um, and and it's, it is similar as mozzarella, but it's slightly sour, and the texture is um, is like like very very interesting because it melts, but the amount of fat is like the right amount. Give but you can, you can even like just do like. A... <laughs> <laughs> we can then. We can, well, I, well, we'll find that out. You build yourself up. <laughs> 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 exactly. We can scrub. <laughs> no, we won't scrub. It happened once. It happened once. I swear. Jerry's going to be laughing at this. If it doesn't, <laughs> you can't skip around Jerry's cheese. Let's go on. Right. So what Anyways, are we doing now then? So now we have the we have the papers. Right. And then we have the you know these ones. And then what you do is to press it gently, and then you put the other one on top. And now, then, this, this press you get made in the UK as well. Yes, as well. And it's this uh, very, very old foundry. It's one of the oldest foundries yeah. in the UK. Look at that. And, yeah. uh, and they are just incredible. So it, it is, I think it's all about uh, collaboration. This, this yeah. concept of the whole restaurant, to be able to work with local farmers, but also local craft makers, to be able to do what we do in Mexico in the best way possible. Well, I don't, cause I'll move this over to one side, because yeah. I'm going to have a go at making a few nope. of these while you're yeah, doing yeah. that. It's important that it's not too thin. Not too thin. So you right. start off with these. So yeah. This goes on the top, you press yeah. it down, and what do you fill it with then? What's, yeah. what's the so filling? Then now the filling is going to be the cheese, basically, and wild garlic. Wild garlic is one of my favorite ingredients ever. And right now in spring, is uh, it's all over. The country. Do you have wild garlic in Mexico? Is that? I, I don't. I don't really know, but probably not. It's not something that grow in a very tropical like uh, weather. Yeah. You know, we have coconuts and pineapples, but we don't have wild <laughs> garlic. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't. You don't have rhubarb. That we and don't have rhubarb. Yeah, yeah. We don't have rhubarb. Yeah. Exactly. And this is one of the fascinations with your food as well. A bit like yeah. yourself, really. You, you take. You, you've got a fascination with all the ingredients we have in the UK. Yeah. Both of you, really. Yeah. Like we say before, we need to look after the. Yeah. The people around you. Yeah. This is the people who look after you. That's it. And yeah. Collaboration is the most beautiful thing. So what are we doing so then? How do we make anyways. these? So then the thing is that we, we put the cheese like that. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to put enough quantity. Yeah. You know, and to leave the edges without anything, you know? So you just go okay. like, kind of like that. Yeah. And then okay. put the wild garlic in there like that. And then what you're going to do, you, know, you do like this and then... I'm, I'm watching. And then you, you hold it with these two fingers. You hold it, and then you go like that. And then okay. you press the top, and then the edges. And it, it's interesting because it just, just naturally falls and sticks. Right. And then that is what, what you do, basically. In Spain, my mom made with tuna. Tuna, oh, with egg, tuna. tomato, and, uh, yeah, and it's, uh, it an is, egg. It is incredible. It's is lovely. This but it's not with corn. But it is incredible the similarities that we do we have with Spanish food and Mexican food. So how do you feel about when you come to the UK and you, you taste one of these and it's got it's You're got fast. it's got cheddar cheese on it? Uh, I I am used to it to be honest. It's not only about the UK. I think it's about the whole world that uh, outside Mexico Mexican food is not as it's not represented as it might it, it should I, I guess in in terms of like authenticity. There is this uh, misconception of like Tex-Mex food, you know? Which food of Texas and Tex-Mex food, when it's well done in Texas, is amazing. Yeah. But it's just a different type of cuisine. Yeah. So this is the real deal. Here we go. This is definitely... I think it's quite important real. what you say, but it's quite important as well that people don't be able to, to make the quesadilla when they cheese, because it's going to be difficult yeah. to do something else. Yeah. yeah. There you go. 
And then it's always... So, so I'm going to deep for fry these, then, yeah? Go for it. So, now, tell us what you're going to be doing now, then. You're going to be you're busy cooking away. So, what are yeah. you going to be doing now? So, now, there's no dish in Mexico without a good salsa. OK. Right? So, the salsas are the core and the heart of Mexican cooking. So, normally, you will do sauces with uh, tomatoes. Yeah. We don't really have tomatoes at this time of the year. So what we have is forced rhubarb. So we're going to do our forced rhubarb salsa. OK. So I'll chop this, because I know you want to get this on as well. Uh, and rhubarb you don't have in, in, in Mexico as well. So this is where you take influences from all over the place that you've been doing. Yeah. Because you travelled all over the place, Copenhagen. Did you work at Noma for a while? Yes. You were, you were yeah. there? Yeah, I used to work at Noma, and I organised this uh, pop-up that was called Noma Mexico. And then coming into the UK, you've got your own site now, Michelin Star. Yeah, we're, I'm really proud of our team in Col. That recognition is is all about the is the quality, but also is the 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 keeping keeping the standard every day. You know, yeah. like the consistency yeah. Yeah. of the standard, which is uh, which is something that the guys are making incredible job every day. I'm really proud of what what, what we've been achieving. And also excited because it's, there is uh, much more that we can that we can do. More in the you pipeline, know? right? Yes. So I know you got this pan, so pan on. So yep. the, they're cooking away nicely. I'll okay. leave you to get the rhubarb in. So. Cool. So we have the pan on, and yeah. then we're gonna add the the garlic first. Yeah. Then we're gonna put the rhubarb on. Yeah. And then we're gonna add some brown sugar, basically. Yeah. Just move it around. Tell me how much? Ah, just a little bit. Yeah, like that. Just a bit more. There you go. There you go. So we're doing like a savory rhubarb compote. Right. What, what do you want in the dressing? You want? For, for the dressing, I think we're going to put these uh, chilies. I'm going to let you chop these. <laughs> yeah, so we have this... Uh... They look a bit lethal to me. What? These the scotch bonnets? <laughs> yeah, this is scotch bonnet. Right. Scotch bonnet. So this is the dressing side of it. So we've got the salsa bit there, the dressing bit here. Yeah. And they're cooking We're going to add to the sauce. We're going to yeah. take the... When, when it's... Then... You know when, when it, it sounds like that, is that ready? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. That looks pretty good to me. You know why? Because the cheese is melted and it's kind of coming out <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So then that is why it sound, they sound like that. OK. So okay. we've got... Our... Sauce is ready. I'm just yeah. going to put some chilies in there. Ooh. This is, is this arbol, arbol chili. And then we just leave it... Reducing a tiny bit yeah. while you are helping me with the dressing. So this is the rhubarb juice in right. here. Yeah, so then the idea is that we're going to use the rhubarb juice instead of vinegar. So that's enough. Yeah. We, the important thing when you add the chilies yeah. is that you crush them a little bit. Yeah. So we're just going to crush the chilies. Do you want some veg oil in here? Uh, yeah. Just going to add the, a little bit of chili in there. That's fine. OK. And then now, I'm going to add some fresh rhubarb juice to the sauce. Yeah. Just to make it a little bit more red. OK. And tart as well, you know? OK. And, uh, yeah, so then this is uh, pretty much done. So I'm yeah. just going to take some of it and put it here in our mortar. It's important that you don't... You try to avoid um, too much liquid because... Uh, this otherwise is, this, this is what I love about to... proper, authentic. Yeah, I love this. I don't have a blender at home. Yeah. I just have this because uh, you don't have to watch a blender, you know, you just... What do you uh, call this in Mexico? It's called molcajete. Okay. Molcajete, yeah. And I love this, that you want to serve this dish on as well, because we've got yeah. over here, look, look at this dish. Is this, this made in a different part of the UK? Or is in this Scotland. Made... In Scotland. You yeah. are joking. <laughs> <No. laughs> this is Scotland? Yeah, 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 Scotland. Where is the little pig? That's from Mexico, yeah. All oh, right, OK, OK, OK. Yeah. yeah, so then now that the rhubarb is going to look like a little kind of jam, and then over here, you want me to make the salad. So you've got in here Alexander's, which we've had on the show before. Yeah, we have Alexander's, we have some wild chervil and uh, black, wild black mustard. Right. And did you want some wild garlic in here or not? Yes, no. please, please. Just a few bits of yeah, wild garlic. Yeah, maybe we can just, like, chop it a little bit. Yeah. Or just with the hands, maybe. And I just... I, I haven't tried this. Let's try it. It's important. Yeah. Important to try, right? Um, so it's... Um, the, um, hmm, do you want to try? No, I'm going to try at the end. No. I'm, going to, I'm trusting you. You're, you're in the top 100 best, <laughs> Chief. I'm, I built you on a pedestal. I think it needs to be a little bit more spicy, you know? 
Just gonna really? Add some, yeah, it's just going to add the, a little bit more chilli on it. You just put one scotch bonnet for about four no, portions no, in No, no, this is the oh, this arbol, is the arbol chili. Yeah. So I'm just gonna I just gonna crush it just to. So the thing is that some people think that spicy is just something that hits or burns your mouth. Yeah. But I think spice it's a flavor. The spicy it can warm everything up, you know. Yeah. Or yeah, I did maybe, to our, or our, burn our, everything up. Or so. we did to Matt, our sound sound guy in yeah. in America. Yeah. I got him to try fresh Szechuan for the very very first time. All oh, right. It numbs your mouth for a yeah. week. Oh, for a yeah, week. Yeah, for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to really. It was funny. Yeah. You need to know what you're doing, I yeah. guess. Well, he know? didn't. That's why we got him. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, okay. So that's it. And then we're gonna just play the, our quesadillas here. They look great. And also, I think it's something that you can just do, you can do so fast, you know? Yeah. yeah. So then a little bit of the creme fraiche. Yeah. It's intriguing. When you taste, taste a bit like this, you think, oh, with it, with the it looks nothing like nothing this, like does that. it? Nothing like that. <laughs> and then this amazing salad that you made on top of the current fish, like that. Give us the name of this dish, then. Wild garlic quesadillas with drunk rhubarb salsa. That's what it is. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'll leave one out for, for you. One out for us. We'll have a little taste of the old salsa with it. Why not? Nice. There you go, Sheffy. Thank you, my dear. Let you dive into that. Yes. Oh, look at that. That's the test. Oh. Uh... Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> mmm. Oh, yeah. The flavour of the corn is just... Mmm. Spicy, just lovely. How do you make it taste like that? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? And it all uses... We've got to thank this gentleman again. What's his name again? Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> thank you very much, yeah. Jerry, for this. It works. All that effort put in. Mm. I don't know what the hell I'm holding up, but this, this works. <laughs> it's fantastic. But there we have it. Santiago, everybody! <laughs> Brilliant, that. Brilliant. Uh, Jose, we tried to top trump that dish as he takes over the kitchen very shortly. And I'll be laying on a second course for Paul Potts a little bit later on in the show. But join us after the break where we're heading down to the farm for a spot of lambing. I'll see you in a bit. This is amazing. Mm. It is absolutely delicious. Isn't that delicious? It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Welcome back. Now we're chatting some more to singing superstar Paul Potts a little bit later. And we've got a masterclass in summer pudding coming right up. But first, I'm here with Jose and Santiago because now spring is in the air and Easter is on its way. I want to find out a little bit more about all the hard work that goes into putting the amazing produce onto our plates. So to do that, I thought we'd go to Hollycombe Farm in the South Downs, which is just over there, Santiago. So oh. it's, it's about a few miles in that direction. <laughs> uh, to Thanks. speak to Ed Jenner about the realities of farming life. So first of all, Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, now, nice now, meeting. it's first of all, give us give us a little insight in the farm. How big is it, and how many sheep have you got? So our farm is just under five hundred acres, um, which is a sort of medium sized farm, I'd say, in, in the UK. We'll be lambing two hundred and thirty ewes this year. We keep seventy of our lambs from last year to breed from, so they're out in the field. Um, we have six rams, and then we have a small native breed beef herd. We grow some veg, we coppice some chestnut, we have some arable lamb. Um, so it's a proper true mixed farm still. So what type of lamb do we have behind us? What breed are they? This is a clean lamb. From, it's a Welsh breed. Um, and then what we do here is have a south down ram. All our rams are south down, so we put... We, we and all of our lambs end up across between the South Down, which is our native breed to this area. Um, they finish really well on grass, um, and it's really important to keep the native breeds alive and, and going and support them. Um, but then we cross them onto a, a clean ewe, which are typically very good mothers, um, have a bigger body shape, a sort of better carcass for that butchers prefer. They're quite prolific, so they're good. 
and, and twins. Is it, and are they? Are they? Ha tell me when the process starts. When do you? When do you release the the rams into the field with the ewes and um, and and you're about to go through the busy period as they start to give birth now this this coming month. So wh when do you start that? What time of year? The rams go in with the ewes in in the autumn. Uh, that that's called tupping. Um, and then the gestation period is 156 days for a sheep. So that's five months. That brings us through to spring. And now we've just started our, our first hand um, being born. And, and um, yeah, we're into, the, we're into it now. What I keep saying to people whenever I meet them about, you know, if you, if you were doing this and, and you won the lottery tomorrow, very, very few of you would, would decide to buy a plot of land in Wales or wherever and down the road in Lip lip up and be a farmer and put in the hours that you guys do. This is why we as chefs and people at home need to respect you a lot more. I, I say this all the time. The insight of your hours, you start work at when and when do you go to sleep? You can't, I mean, you can't have much sleep from now for the next month. How many hours a day do you sleep at the moment, roughly? The routine from now on is um, I get up at about half four or five, come out into the shed, check them all, if there's any lambs that are born overnight, you know, sort them out, put them into these individual pens um, so that we can keep a close eye on them. But then we're out here um, all day feeding them, continuing with that process, moving them around before we put them out in the field. Um, and I'll, I'll come out for my last check at about midnight and then depending on what's going on, you know, if, if, if everything seems quiet, I'll go to bed then. Um, it might be that I'm out here for an hour or so, um, sorting the final ones out, and then, and then yeah, back out at half four, five. This goes on in internally inside for, for about a month, but, I mean, it doesn't stop when you take them out onto the field, does it, really? Because, I mean, even then, you've still got to do... I mean, there's a tremendous amount of work, because then you've got predators and everything else that you've got to look after. It, it never stops. Yeah, I mean that this this month is is definitely the the big month for us. Um, when when they're out in the field, it's more of a, you know, d depending on the season and you know the you know when in haymaking we do very long hours again. Um, at harvest is very long hours again. Um, so the, the seasonal fluctuations and this is the real the, the month that's the most intense for sure. I can see from your eyes that you're knackered. Uh, I can see I can see that you've got a long road ahead. Uh, you're just about to start. We've got one behind us. You've got many more uh, late nights to go. But I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing. And, and uh, hopefully people watching this, the next time they go around a supermarket, will look at where the lamb is from and, and buy it from this country as well. And that's thanks to you guys for doing it as well. So uh, thank you very much and good luck with everything over the coming months. Thanks for having me. It's a, always a pleasure. Next time I'm down your way, I'll come and visit. Yeah, please do. Come and cook here. Yeah, I'm not putting in a shift. I'm not putting in a shift like yours, though, but I'll come in and visit. <laughs> Do some cooking, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, cheers, Ed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers, bud. Thank you. Uh, cheers. Right, Jose will be serving up a sensational Spanish dish for us shortly, and I'll be making a Korean fish burger for my guest Paul Potts at the end of the show. But I'll see you after the break. When we're back in the kitchen, I'm giving you a masterclass in summer pudding. I'll see you soon. Just before you go, just check that out. Oh, sweet. How wonderful is that? Yeah, that's eh? so sweet. Wonderful, huh? Welcome back. Now we're treating Paul Potts to my Korean fish burger a little bit later. But first, now where the clocks have changed and we're officially in British summertime, I thought this week's Masterclass, I thought I'd show you how to make a dessert that you want to try over the next coming months. It's a summer pudding. So it used to be called hydropathic pudding uh, back in about 1860s. There's first record of summer pudding, I suppose. And then sometimes it's called Malvern pudding as well. The key to it, I always find, with summer pudding is keep it as fresh as possible. The minute you apply heat to any of this, and there's nothing wrong with that, you're creating a sort of a, a French-style sauce called a coulis, where you warm everything up with a little sugar syrup. But the trouble is you end up with this sort of jammy taste, this, this cooked fruit taste. And I think you want the freshness of this. And because of that, we do it a particular way. So rather than cook the berries, where you get more liquid out of it, if I was to put these into a pan and stew them with a little bit of water and maybe some lemon juice, touch of sugar, that kind of stuff, we do get more liquid out of it, but then we detract from the taste of the fresh fruit, what it's supposed to be in the first place, the summer side of the summer pudding. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a sauce for this, first of all. And it is a sauce. We're not in France. It's not coolie. When you nip over to Calais, you can call it coolie, but over here, it's not. 
It's a sauce. And we're going to blend the raspberries with the strawberries. Now, what I would use is probably about three quarters raspberries and a quarter strawberry. Now, if you wanted it darker, of course, then you can add things like blueberries and blackberries to it as well if you want. But we can just blend all this. Now, I don't put any sugar in here. No lemon juice, sugar, nothing. We just blend. Mm -hmm. So while that's blending, we turn our attention to the moulds. I'm going to use two sort of small moulds like this. You can, if you want, make a larger one, but these are individual sized portions. We call these little Dario moulds. So if you're looking for the internet to buy one of these, this is what you do, sponge pudding in, that kind of sort of stuff. These are great little moulds. So you can use a teacup if you wanted to, coffee cup. It's entirely up to you if you haven't got one of these. So you're not going to cook with them anyway. So you see you've got your nice little sauce there. You can switch this off. Now onto our moulds. And we want to use this cling film to line our moulds. So you to get a nice couple of pieces of cling film like that. And then the reason for the oil is it makes the cling film stick to the bottom. Now, you can use this in a larger mould or a glass bowl if you wanted to. <coughs> the same process of fly, and it makes it much easier to get it out afterwards. It's a good little tip, that, with the cling film. So once we've got to that stage, we can then turn our attention to the bread. Now, I like to use sort of thin bread for this one, and what we want, really, for this is sort of oblongs first for the, for the edges. And for that, get yourself a serrated knife, and we're going to cut the crusts off like that. And it's a good idea to use the thinnest bread you can find. So try not to use thick bread, otherwise you end up with a bit of a... Well, more of a bread pudding than a fruit pudding at the end of it, too, too thick with the bread. So the thinnest bread you can get hold of. And then we're going to slice the crusts off like that, trim this all off, and then... We're then going to cut this into oblongs. That will give us the sides around the edge. So this is going to go in like building blocks around the edge, really. Obviously, if you're using a larger bowl, you can then use a full slice of bread. And then for this now, we want a circle for the bottom and a circle for the top. So invest in some cutters. If not, you can just cut this out anyway. But you just take some cutters, and we've got two circles. This is going to go in the bottom of these two. And then these ones, we can then take a larger cutter like that, and you pop that in there. Utilise this bread for treacle tart, that kind of stuff like that. Don't go giving it to the ducks, otherwise it'll properly kick off. <laughs> so I made the mistake, don't I'm doing that again. Um, we're then just going to blend it. Now, if it's a bit thick at this point in time, just get yourself a little bit of water, just a tiny bit of water. And, and for that, I'm just going to use a little bowl. And we can take a spoon. And just drop a little bit of water into this while you're blending it. Now, you don't want too much. Just drop a touch of water in. Perfect. And you can see from the colour of that, most importantly, the taste of it, you get this amazing smell and colour. But the problem is for that, you offset the amount of liquid that you have. So you're taking sort of... You, you're getting more flavour, but less liquid. So you get more of a punch of flavour with this. Now, what we're doing is just pass this through a sieve. So take this, I'll bring it over here so you can see. If you're ever up in Scotland, they, to be honest, have the best raspberries anywhere. If you go to a garden centre in Scotland, get yourself a raspberry plant like I've done, bring it back down home and plant them, You'll have some of the best raspberries around. They really are spectacular. So, that's that. And that's that one. So that's our sauce side of it. We can then make our filling side of this. So I'll move that to one side like that. Our filling side of it comes in the form of just a few bits of fruit. So you can take... Again, we can take some raspberries. Like that. Leaving some for a little garnish as well. We can take some blackberries. We can then have some blueberries. And this is where, I mean, the older cookbooks, they used to cook these. Um, I, think, I think you get much better flavour if you don't cook it. Some lovely strawberries, particularly when stuff's starting to come into season, like your strawberries, like your raspberries, that kind of stuff, utilising all the amazing produce. So 
we're just going to take these, chop them all up. And when you chop them all up, make sure they're into sort of reasonable sort of even sized pieces for this. And then I can take a little bit of the sauce just to bind it together. And again, I put no sugar in this. No sugar at all. I've just got the great flavour. If you want to change the texture of this and flavour to this, <clears throat> you can add whatever you want. You can add, I mean, even add basil to this. Basil with things like strawberries tastes amazing. Actually, tastes like basil ends up tasting like pistachio nuts. So you can change this. Rather than putting mint in it, which is quite strong, do it with a little bit of basil, maybe, or, or do it like I'm doing it. Just allow the flavour of the fruit. And then what we do is take our little bit of bread. So we take the bread, first of all, and dip that in the bottom. That's your circular piece of bread. So the small bit goes in the base, like that. Then we're going to take the edges and take... It's probably going to take two of these, maybe two and a bit. And what we want to do is, when you dip those into the sauce, just wipe off any excess and then just overlap it, just ever so slightly. See that? Just overlapped. And then you can take this other bit of bread, like that, oop, that, that. <laughs> so, that fits in there. So another one, over like that, in that corner. Another one, wipe off any excess, over a little bit, and then the remaining bit of bread, trim it up like that, eat that and use that. And we can dip that. And you see the reason why we use thin bread is that you get a lot more filling in. So then what you can do, move that to one side. We can then turn our attention to our filling and place our filling in. And you want to sort of cram this all in. So, you know, it is a fruit pudding, so you want to get plenty of it in. Like that. So you cramming it all in. Now, I remember my mum used to make this. And at this moment in time when she used to do this, she used to send me out. We lived on a farm to go out and find a brick. So, so, so you used to get anything sort of like a brick or something like that to, for weight, really, because you used to have to sit in the fridge for about a couple of days to then firm up. But by doing it this way and compressing the fruit, particularly on a small portion, like, see how much fruit we've got in there? All that's gone we've got in the bowl. You can really compress it down. Like that. Then, while my hands are still dirty, we then take a little bit more of this bread. But this time, I'm going to invert it that way. So that's the bit that's not touched, this one. And then we can compress it down like this. So you're really pressing it down. So again, dip it in. But rather than do the opposite of what you've done with the last ones, turn that over. And then you can sit that in the fridge. You can have that in the fridge overnight if you wanted to. No need to find a brick. Then what we do is you just hold your finger and thumb together, like that, and if you pull it in between your finger and thumb, the cling film, it just comes straight out, like that. So again, hold it in, finger and thumb between the cling film, otherwise what happens is the, the filling falls out. So you must put your finger and thumb together like that, pull it out, and it just comes straight off, like that. So there's your summer pudding or Malvern pudding, or however you want to call it. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to finish this off with a little bit of clotted cream. If you've got time and you've got... Well, you want to do this a little bit fancy, you can then take a little bit of sugar work. And I'm just going to show you how quickly you can finish this a simple little dessert. I've just got some caster sugar in the pan. I've got some warm water over here for a nice little clotted cream, but to simply plate it up, we can then grab our summer pudding Lift that on there. And then using a few bits of leftover fruit, we've got some raspberries, some strawberries, blackberries, that kind of stuff, a little bit of mint, some cherry maybe. And then you can simply garnish this with the sauce and everything else. So the sugar, I'm just heating up. And you see this sauce, this beautiful colour that you get from sauce. If you want it darker, you just put a few blackberries in it. It's as simple as that while you're blending it. But you can see if you just take this, but you see you get this amazing punch of flavour. So that goes over the top. Like that. While you're doing that, mm. taste it, see whether it's nice, which it is. The sugar's starting to caramel, which is just happening quite quickly now. 
we can then just take this off, cool it down, a little bit of water. So just have a pan. It just cools the base of the pan down. Stops the sugar from cooking. Take it off the heat. Back over here with our hot water. Turn the heat off now. Spoon goes in. And get the spoon nice and hot, and in one movement, you quenelle. Let's just call this rocher. But, but. And you just scoop that up like that. You got like that. So that's that. We can then take our little bits of fruit with it as well. A few little bits of cherries if you wanted to. A little bit of raspberries. This is where you put a little bit of sprig of mint on it as well. Touch of ice and sugar over the top. And then finally, if you want to feel a bit glam, you go back over here to finish this off. This is a little bit, it's me being a bit chefy, really, to be honest with you. But we have got serious chefs in today, so I thought, why not? But we're going to take our caramel, and for that, very simply, you can take your caramel and do this. As it warms up, it allows you to do different things with it. So it warms up like that. You can see it's solid now. Look. And then if you warm it back up, it comes back to a liquid. If it gets too hot, it becomes too liquid and unmanageable. So what we do is we keep heating it up and cooling it down. But how we do that is, as you can see, it's getting hotter now. It's coming really liquid. How we do that is we cool it down again. So that sits in the pan. It just allows the base of the pan to cool. And then we can take this, take a steel, and we then take a piece of this sugar, and we spin it around it. Well, you can do this, really. So rather than steel first, I'll show you this. So you can then, this is boiling hot. It's now burning my finger. Now I can't feel the end of my finger. And we take that off like that. Lift that up. And you can then put that on there. And then if you wanted to, rather than that, and you didn't want to burn your finger, you can do this. Take a steel, go around the steel like that. Lift that off, and then hopefully, as soon as it hits the steel, it sets. You then lift that off. And the reason why I'm showing this, it'll probably take you most of the summer to master this. But what you will end up, by autumn, is summer pudding like that. Good luck. <laughs> now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about in a little mask us, then do get in touch. we we'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when a good mate of mine, Jose Pizarro, will be cooking behind these very stoves. I'll see you then. Bye for now. Welcome back. Now, we'll be treating top tenor and all-round foodie fanatic Paul Potts to a final course very shortly. But first, I'm delighted to be back in the kitchen once again with a chef that's revolutionised the way we think about Spanish food in this country. It's the one and only Jose Pizarro. <laughs> Good to have you back, my friend. Good to have you back. Now, what are we going to be doing? Because this looks amazing that we've got in here. A lot to do and a little time. A lot to do a little time. <laughs> so... We are going to do uh, a creamy rice. OK. Risotto, but we never say risotto, as you can imagine. In Spain. In Spain. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, with uh, carabineros, with, uh, well, carabineros that... Gorgeous. We're going to get onto these amazing shrimp in a minute. Now, I know you want to get the rice bit of it, so fire away. What do you do for your for your Spanish not risotto, but not, it's nowhere near risotto? What, what... <laughs> yeah, we are going to... Um, a little bit extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Like that. And then a little bit of garlic already chopped, yeah? 
and then um, San Caramel Isonium. No. Already here. Because so these are just cooked onions, you just cook down and down and down. What I do is I slice the onion very, very well um, and then cover by low heat yeah. with olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Okay. Get in, we are going to add some uh, lovely caramelized onion. Yeah. Uh, don't bury garlic. So tell us about the rice, because this is not like a boria rice. What it's a um, bomba. Bomba rice. It's a bomba rice. It's. Um, is that, that like rum? paella rice or...? Like paella rice. Yeah. The, the good thing is that it absorbs very well all okay. the, the stuff. Yeah? Okay. We are going to put a little bit. So you say this is risotto rice, but you never say risotto. Is this, this the... What, what? Paella, no? No, no, no paella. No, not paella. Paella... <laughs> paella is... Um, is really the authentic paella. Yeah. Supposed to be only 10 ingredients. Okay. All right. Anyway. All right. And now we are going to just... What is that? Now, tell us about this stock, then, because this, this is... I know you want to get it in there. Or, the or beauty right. thing is um, made with one of those prongs. It's... Um, so this is... It's made, it's made with these ones Camarón. over here. Now, now we're going to explain these prawns over here. and I mean, These are amazing. We're going to explain these. The, the, what, what are these, first of all, and where are they from? They are coming from um, Alicante. Yeah. And uh, what the best thing about these prawns is the flavour they have. If you open the head, open that. And what are they called? What, what do you call these? Camarón rojo. Camarón rojo. Camarón. Right. Look at that. Look at these. Look, all of those oils are yeah. here now. OK. Uh, what I'm doing in this stock So is... do, you, do you take the, the, to the, we the peel, shell off? We peel. Use the heads and the bits for there, and then that And the there. cell, and then we have another one for the rest. Got it. All right. Got it. Absolutely amazing. So while the rice is cooking, explain to us what we've got in here. So you're Look, using these for the stock. It's not lame. Let's talk about this bit. So we have this one. This yeah. Corn. What are these? They are quisquillas. Yeah. Quisquillas, or uh, they call here blue belly prawns. Are blue belly see? prawns. Yeah, you can see there. Okay. Yeah. There's the blue belly. That is the blue belly. Okay. What we do is just clean them, take it out there. So you open them out. Yeah. And the row of this, you use... Use it for there. Right. What do you use that for? We shall go. Right. Like that. So are these... Uh, uh, did I say... I mean, I, very... I, think, I think I've had these... I might have had them steamed or fried. Are these the ones that people are used to with when...? Well, they fry. They just coat with uh, corn flour. Right. Fry, this fry very quick. Yeah. And it's absolutely stunning. Right. Because it's really crispy. Yeah. So yeah. You, you fry it whole? Whole. Shell, whole. everything. And they're the incredible. texture. So, so yummy. Wow, they're incredible. That looks amazing. So tell me about, tell me about these, because these, these are what a lot of people are going to be looking at. I mean, just check these out. So we've got, so we got different parts of Spain. Where are these from in Spain? It's coming from Catalonia. Right. Palamos. They call carabineros, and um, they are very deep um, prompts. They look at the colour. No, I'll let you cool. prepare them and yep. I'll carry on doing with the rice okay. first. So, so what, what, do we, what do we do with them, first of all? We are going to eat it. Yeah, we're going to eat it. Yeah. And before that... <laughs> we are going to cut in the middle. So, are, are look they, at I mean, these, these, are, these are highly priced. I mean, these, these are, I mean I've seen these and I've actually ought to order a few for the restaurant, but they, these are not cheap. This is costing more than la lobster. Yeah, OK. Huh? So I know you're going to do the other one. Are yep. you going to do the other one as well? Yeah, I'll give you the why not? Give you the let's do... Let's do... If we do things, do. we do things properly. Yeah, <laughs> well, let's do the You know what well. I mean? They're amazing. So what do you call these? What can people look for these? What are they called? They call carabinero. Right. Um, and you, would you get these all over Spain, or are these just specifically in the north? They, you get north and south. Right, OK. In the Mediterranean and the, um, and the Atlantic. Right. It's amazing, the different types of prawns, visually, but also... In taste, flavours. Flavours, tastes, you know. Incredible, yeah. isn't it? You know. Yeah. And these are, these are deeper, deeper down. Very deep. They will go until 2,000 metres uh, down. Wow, OK. So I'm presuming that's why that... They're, they're not that cheap to buy. They are expensive. Because they're quite difficult to, to get hold of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, okay. like we say, it's, um, it's something very, very special. Of yeah. course, this is quite difficult to get, yeah. but the rice made with lobster 
in the same way is absolutely amazing. Right, so you've got the, the yeah. rice there. And then, do you want a little bit of salt on it? Or are you just... Yeah, a little bit of salt yeah. and, like... See, this is what I love about Spanish food. It's, you know, do you know, I, I, I've known you for a long, long time, and this is what I love about your food. You, and don't get me wrong, I love the Italians, but the Italians, they, the, 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 they announce the food before you even walk into the house. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Do you know when the Spanish just go, there that's go. it, have it. And you just look at it. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, are we just going to grill that for a couple yeah. of minutes? We are going to grill it and then helping me, please, with some monfis cut in a little okay. light. I'll do that. I'll just wipe yes. the board. There we go. And yeah. so this monkfish, this is not from Spain. No, this is a British. This is, this will be, well, the best monkfish I've ever tasted was no, in yeah. Scotland. Absolutely amazing. So. So monkfish, you want sort of chunks of them, I yeah. take it, do you? Like Not that? too much. A little bit smaller, please. A little bit smaller, OK. I'm going to add some of the pepper. These peppers are uh, piquillo. So what is what is that? Just Piqui Piquillo peppers. Wood roasted peppers. North, they roast pepper. OK. So wood roasted peppers. Would you say that people should do, you know, get them the tinned ones are perfectly good, aren't they? The tinned piquillo pepper are absolutely amazing. Half of that with this will be fine. Yeah. yeah. That all right? Lovely. Yeah. OK. So you've got a little bit of the monkfish. You want me to chop a few of the herbs? I've got some yep, chives please. and a little bit of parsley mm -hmm. over here. OK. So we've only got a few more things left to go in, the peas. It's going to the... be the peas right now. All right. So tell everybody about your restaurants then, because you've got a beautiful little restaurant empire in London as well. We a have... range of different places. We have uh, Jose, was the first one in Bermond Street. Yeah. Uh, very lovely tapas bar, a small tapas bar. Then we have... Pizarro, just like two minutes walk in Vermont Street. Liverpool Street is more, it's a bar with lovely tapas. And then open the two one in the Royal Academy of Art. You have. How yeah. it's my English. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, Abu Dhabi. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Why I do this? You I know why? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you love it because you go, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I'll lift these out. Look at these. See? Now, do you want the prawns on the small platter? Uh, no, no, all together. All together? Uh, yeah. So In you the want the big plate. platter? Big plate. <coughs> that is for big man. <laughs> like we do at home. Oh, you want a tip? Yeah, help me with that. Yeah. I like to be like that because all going there together. Oh yes, baby. Look at this plate of food. Look at that plate of food. It's happy food, my friend. I'm gonna stick my neck out here and say, we've been at this house for six years doing that. That is the prettiest plate of food we've seen yet. Look at that. I wouldn't want to pay the bill for those prawns, but thank you for bringing them. <laughs> ah! There we have it. Jose Pizarro, the legend. So what are we going to call this amazing plate of food? Uh, creamy rice. Yeah. With mom face, red prawns and uh, carabineros. That's what it is. It, you, uh, as uh, I said to you, it looks spectacular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it tastes spectacular. And deep in my firm. Look at that. Just look at, look at that. Look at that. It's food. I know it's food, but th there's food and there's food, you know? And this is what I love about Spanish food. You're, you're brilliant at it, but it's great ingredients at its core, though, isn't it? It's all about that. Simple flavour. It's everything that I love about food. And pretty. Very, it's beautiful. It tastes absolutely beautiful. Jose Pizarro, everybody. That is delicious.
Right, we've still got time for one more final dish. I'm not going to top trump that. I'll be trying to top trump it, though, with a show-stopping burger, a fish burger for my guest, Paul Potts. I'll see you after the break. This is unbelievable. Welcome back to the last part of the show, but I'm back in the kitchen with all my guests, Paul Potts, Santiago Lastra and Jose Pizarro. Yay! Uh, right, for my final dish, I thought I'd treat you to a recipe that you're going to love. Uh, this is my Korean fish burger made by my Spaniard friend over here. So, confused? You're going to be with me in a minute, with me as well. But we're going to do this um, nice little sort of version of a fish burger. So, first of all, I want you to toast off the little buns. We're going to use some brioche buns. Okay. Ready for that one? I mean, toast, off all, toast off all that. Then I'm basically just going to simply just cook our mushrooms in the oven, and then we're going to get on and do our fish burger. It starts off with a, with a few prawns, really, at, at its base, and then we're going to use some of this wonderful little tuna and simply, simply cook, cook this. So we'll just take a little bit of butter, just hard butter, there we go. Take a little knob of butter, that's going to sit on there, sit on there, sit on there, simply cook all that with some salt and pepper. You're toasting off my nice little brioche buns like this. They're going to go in there and going to get the whole lot roasted in the oven. Now, I know through all the travels that you've been, venturing through all the things that you've done, over a thousand performances around the world, Korea. So you'll be able to tell us how you pronounce this. <laughs> it's kochujang. That's what it is. This is this fermented chilli paste? Yeah. It's yeah, not it's something I eat a lot of. <laughs> but it's, it's, I love it. I mean, I mean, you love spice as well. Yeah. I mean, you must have tried this, this as well. Have a taste. Well, you're going you're gonna to suffer this, because you've given me sort of scotch bonnet peppers <laughs> all morning. <laughs> but, but this is this nice, spicy, spicy paste. It looks paste. quite sweet as well. Yeah, well, they, they ferment it, apparently, with barrels. It's just... Um, it's oh, just wow. It's really, really depth of flavour. It's amazing. Really it's in there. Like, so, it's like spicy tamarind. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then what we're going to do, to make this, so you just, just pulse this and then wow. finish. That's that one. And then I'm going to take this mixture and then we're going to chop the, the, the uh, prawns through it and add some of this tuna to it as well. Now, we talked earlier about your album. Your album is... What, what, what number have we got now? Is it five, six on your album? Uh, this is number seven. Seven, seven. Album's number seven. Uh, and we were saying earlier that, that it's your first classical album. Well, people have known you for, since 2007, Britain's Got Talent, you know. Classical, why are you calling this your first classical album? Well, it's the first one that's qualified for the classical charts. And, and, and it, it, was, it was influenced by lockdown in as much that you could, you could forbid lots of things, but you couldn't forbid music. So the title of the album then became Musica Non Proibita, which means music's not forbidden. Because you started, to, you mentioned the fact in lockdown, you, you were doing these performances online then, were you, for your, for your yeah. fans and bits and pieces. What was that like? It was kind of bizarre performing with no audience. I mean, I think the weirdest thing I did was to do an hour-long performance with Royal Albert Hall in my... Me it, it literally in a room in the house with no audience. So I had to pre-record it. And the worst thing is, you make a mistake. In a live performance, you have to keep going. But you're doing something live to tape, so to speak. You know you've made a mistake. You know you're recording it. So you go back to the start and start again. So I think I started uh, the Mexican song Granada about six times because I fluffed one word. And in the end, I just had to say, no, 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 I just couldn't keep going because that wasn't going to be doing you this know, you know that song, do you? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to sing, that song. It's hard yeah. to sing. Very, very passionate. Mm. Passionate song. And how do you do that in different languages? How, do, how, do you, how on earth do you even begin to do that? Do you have to learn the language or do you have to just learn the song and that's it? It's helpful to understand what you're singing um, because that can remind you of the lyrics. Um, Korean's really difficult because they've got 15 different vowels. And I remember I was singing a song called Korean Gungang San, which is longer for Mount Gungang. And there was one bit where I <laughs> accidentally... It's like almost like you're... It's, it's, like, it's, like, I'm talking like, it's like talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and the audience laughed at one point because I accidentally swore during the song. All oh, right. It's not something you can repeat. In, yeah. it's, it's not just a simple B word. It's yeah. something oh. that's really, oh, really very rude, but oh. completely by accident. So is it, one, is it one of those things, I suppose, with you, really, once you've finished one album, you then go on tour all around the globe, and then, I presume, as soon as you come back, you've got to start thinking about the next album. Is that, is that the case? That's kind of how it works, yeah. Because um, for, for a lot of musicians, that you know, you just hit the UK and stuff like that, but you went so global so quickly 
what was it? It was one of the one of the most watched things on YouTube when it first started. We we're talking about mobile phones because that's where you were working before any of this. Mm. There wasn't any Apple phones then, or they'd just come out. They were just about to come out. Um, it was it was so early that you you could you could you could buy an iPhone and take photographs with it, but you couldn't send the photographs to anybody because <laughs> it wasn't set up for pictures. Yeah, like infrared, right? <laughs> Had to put it together. You're too young for this. You're too, <laughs> you're too young. In fact, you shouldn't be in here. Why have they let you in here? It's depressing me. <laughs> but, it, but it is, you know, you, you go back then and, and, and obviously doing the touring that you're doing, you almost just finish one, one tour because I'm presuming when, you're, when you bring out an album, you do the UK tour first, would that be? Or you... Um, it, it varies, really... it varies. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll start in Korea or, or start in Japan or in, um, or in Germany. Um, it's wherever it calls me, really. And, and what, what, because oh, we have get a lot, a lot of people come on and talk music and bits and pieces. Germany seems to be, you know, a big market for, for all singers, whether it be classical, whether it be pop. What is it about, what is, do, do they have any of their own talent out there or is it just... Nick in hours. What, what, what is it about? <laughs> well, it always fascinates me, because with, in, in Germany, you would, it, it seems a huge, probably your biggest market outside of the UK or something yeah. like that, with a lot of people. Um, I, think it's, I think it's one of those markets that's still a, a tiny bit old-fashioned in, in a good way. They're still buying music, and they still love the international, the international music from outside of Germany as well as within Germany. You see, look, you've got the little prawn burgers like these. Oh, wow, but look at this stick. They stick. But like, they stick right? if, you, if you blend it together. Because so, of this. It's just because of the right. shrimp. Yeah. And, and if you're doing things like, if you're doing simple prawn toast, you yeah. just put a little bit of egg white mm, to yeah, bind yeah, it yeah. and it sticks to the bread nicely. But then all we can do then is just pop this and then just stick it in the oven for a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, we'll take our attention to our little lettuce and bits and pieces and we can start to slice this all up. Is and that a just... little gem or...? Sorry? Little gem. Yeah. I mean, I love little gem. You can, you can shock little gem, um, ice cold water, uh, which is just... Brings it, brings it right back up again. But for this, I think it's fine. And then we've got our tuna, perfectly cooked by our chefy over here. That's tomatoes. Yeah, in, in Korea, a lot of them use little leaves of lettuce to put meat in, and then they pick, pick up the garlic, like put it in the red bean sauce, and then put it inside the inside the parcel of lettuce. And like that's like, that's the only way I yeah. That's uh, that's the way I that's the way I eat my greens. In I've got to say, in, I've been I've been doing Saturday morning shows for 16 years. I don't think I've ever met anybody that knows more about food as a guest. <laughs> than you do. <laughs> you know, you get the feeling that you've talked about music, now let's talk about food. You have an equal passion with that. Yeah, I think there's so many influence, there's so many similarities between music and food and wine, because there's all... There isn't, you have, there does not sing. There isn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the... It's... <laughs> <laughs> well, you listen to music while you cook, no? I guess. So. Well, it's, it's the passion involved in it as well, because if you really care about it, you, you actually end up putting more into it. Yeah, I suppose you're right, but, but I think, yeah, yeah, the, the singing side of it, you know, I get, I get, I get I the feeling because I mean, I, 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 I play the guitar or try to play the guitar, but it's one of those things that I, I find, like food, you, you, you can, I suppose it's like, it's very similar to doing what you're doing. You, you never perfect a song. You never perfect food. Mm. Mm. You never perfect it. Ever, you never yeah. ever. Always you, evolving, you create, yeah. create a nice dish, but it's never perfect. Nothing's ever perfect. It's, it's the reason why following a recipe and a recipe book, letter for letter, is the worst thing you can do. Mm. You've got to go for. You've got to go by how it tastes. Don't as say you're that. Cooking. Don't say that. I'm on book thirty one. <laughs> 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 well, easy with that, easy with that. I'm going to have to pull you up on that one. Back onto the food. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's one of those things where... And it's a bit like learning to play the guitar. You know, you, you, you never, you're never going to get there. You want more, that's it. But you're never going to get there. You just try to, be, try to do it better and better each time. And I get the feeling... And, and that must be so difficult when, you, when you're doing stuff like as iconic as we've just heard earlier on the show. You know the nested dormers of this world and stuff like that. It must be. Do you also look back and say, "I've messed it up there. I've looked because because to, I, I, to, I, I'm I, listening to you. I and do think that's, that's, you've just nailed that. I'll often go through things like that. Um, but I mean, the similar similarity between recipes and a music book is basically you start with the original, and then you can adapt it afterwards. And that's what you do in music, and that's what you do cook, with cooking. When you start tasting things, and well, I like that, but I let's try it with more salt. Yeah. Change things, make That's little changes. That's called winging it, where I come from. <laughs> I, do you have a, do you have a say like that in Spain? Called winging totally. It? Winging it. Winging it. Winging it. Winging it. <laughs> winging it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right, so we've got our... Look, look at these prawn burgers, look. I'll give you the pan, so you can get rid of the pan for me, but... Look. Wow, that's insane, right? Take Beautiful, the prawn huh? burgers. Look at these. You doing your plate? No, it's pan, it's fine, that's, thank you. And then we're going to take our tomato. That's my yes. kind of burger. We'll just put a little tequila. bit of... Tequila. Tequila, yeah. <laughs> Don't get him started. It started about tequila. That... Yeah, we just finished the bottle already. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that uh, bottle that you brought earlier, I'm now going to run a car for a fortnight on that stuff. Nice. Um, put this over the top. A little bit of tuna. Mm. Wow. Go on there. Building up some texture. It's just on the worm. Mm. <laughs> bit of that. On the top. Tell you what, Chef, this is all right, isn't it? Yeah, look at this. Yes, look at me, yeah. Look at this. A little bit of that, a little bit of lime on the top, a little bit of black pepper. I can do that. There you go. And then we've got some of this oh, dressing. Nice. And then I'm going to take wow. dressing over the top. <laughs> That's amazing, <laughs> man. A bit of that. Come on, baby. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. And then a few sticks. <laughs> there you go. One stick. One stick, another wow. stick, and there we have it. Sort of my version of kind of a Korean fish burger made by a Yorkshireman and a Spanish lad. Confused? I would be as well, but there we have it. <laughs> Job done. Right, we'll take the middle one, Chief. Yes. Just these, these two gents, with Ooh. one each. Uh, I don't know how you eat it, I just cook it. You might want to just, wanna just press it down. And like, like I, think it's, I think it's going to need some deconstructing. <laughs> <laughs> just go for it. It's yeah. a very popular term in restaurants. Oh, you're right cutting it. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Just need to go for it. Dirty. Yeah. Spicy. Spicy, I like that. Mm. Mine's already fallen apart. Look at that. <laughs> Nice, no? Amazing. You know what? Happy with that? I love it. I love it. Oh, life is, that, life that'll, be that'll be turned into a Mexican dish in his <laughs> restaurant. Like, yeah. I guarantee I'll be walking through London going, where's that idea of that burger come from? Yes, exactly. That, that prawn burger. Stood, when, I, when I paid a visit to Mexico via Hampshire. That's the one. There's already one there. That's it, that's it. That's it. That's it. Well, that's it. That's all we've got time for today. Massive thank you to all my guests. Uh, Tom Greasy, uh, Ed Jenner, Jose Pissarro, Santiago Lastra, and, of course, Paul Potts. Yeah. Best look with the album. You don't need it. But anyway, see you around the globe as well. There you go. We'll see you back at the same time next Saturday morning when we'll be celebrating Easter weekend with more Top Chefs and other brilliant guests. Until then, I'll see you at my house next week. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. It's all right, that one, isn't it? Bravo. <laughs>